Well, we're here on the seventh day of Unleavened Bread. We have commemorated the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on our behalf, uh, partaking of the Passover. We have for seven days put out leavened bread and partaken of unleavened bread, uh, symbolic of repenting and rejecting sin, as well as, again, taking in the unleavened bread or that of righteousness, wanting to be like our Savior Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8 are very good chapters to study uh, during this time of the year, during the Passover season, the Days of Unleavened Bread, as well as Pentecost. Uh, they go through and discuss uh, many of the concepts, uh, many of the understandings that we have about these days. They are very important sections that help solidify our understanding of the Passover unleavened bread as well as, as Pentecost. They discuss being saved by grace. That would be the Passover. They discuss the value of God's law. We're going to look at unleavened bread in that section. It also talks about living by the Spirit, which also involves pen, uh, unleavened bread and Pentecost, because we live by the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, made possible by the Spirit that God gives to us. So Paul talks about a number of different subjects, and he talks about grace, and he talks about law. And you will find some writers who will tell you that Paul was conflicted. You know, he, 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 he wasn't sure what he was talking about at times. Because he talked about being saved by grace, but he talked about the value of the law, that it, we're not under bondage. And you have those who believe in salvation by grace without the law, and they'll quote Paul extensively. Then you'll have some who read the Apostle Paul who do believe in law, and they will quote other sections of Paul that talk about the value of law. Now, we, of course, realize and believe that it isn't just grace or law, but it's law and grace, that they flow together very, very beautifully, and that Paul was not really conflicted in how he wrote. Uh, for all of us here, we need to understand that when Paul talks about salvation, when he talks about being saved, he writes about the grace of God, and that the law can't save you. And, of course, the reason being is the law cannot what? can't forgive your sins. And so he talks extensively about the Passover, the grace of Jesus Christ. But then he also writes about the value of law. So he has another subject that he will cover. And when he talks about a standard to live by, how we are to live our lives, he talks again about the value of law. Uh, unfortunately, there are too many quote-unquote educated people who can't put that together and comprehend that. And I realize Peter said that Paul's writings are sometimes hard to be understood based on how he expressed himself. Now, I'll tell you this. If Peter says it was sometimes hard for him to understand, where does that put us? You know, but we can't understand. In chapter 5, still in the introduction, I mentioned 5, 6, 7, and 8. In chapter 5, Paul talks about being justified by faith. That's the Passover, specifically verse 1. In verse 20, he says, where sin abounded, grace abounded more. Again, talking about the Passover. In verse 21, he discusses being saved by grace through Jesus Christ. Again, Passover. And then he drops on down to chapter 6. Now, Paul didn't drop down to chapter 6. He wrote it we had someone come along and divide it up for us, which I am very grateful they did, personally. But you come to chapter 6, and Paul asked this question since he devoted so much time to, to grace and Christ and salvation through him, and not so much the law. He says in verse 1 of chapter 6, Shall we then continue in sin? That this grace I've been discussing can abound? He says, Certainly not. God forbid. How can we who have died to sin, who put the leavening out, live any more that way of life? 
So now he talks about the value of, of law. We're, we're dead to sin, he tells us, following verse 1 and 2. We've died to sin. And, of course, we know 1 John 3 4 tells us what? Sin is the transgression of the law. We've died to wanting to transgress and go against the teachings of God Almighty. You drop down to chapter 7. And you find now the Apostle Paul discussing how the law identifies sin. Verses 6 and 7. He also says that sin was the issue, not the law. The whole, as a matter of fact, he says the law is holy and the commandments holy, just, and good. Verse 11 and 12. And then Paul discusses his dilemma. Things that he faced with his understanding. He, he discusses his dilemma. A dilemma uh, that some of us might face at times. I think all of you know the dilemma I'm referencing in Romans chapter 7, do you not? He talks about how wonderful the law is, but he says, I find myself at times acting carnally. I find myself living after the flesh occasionally because the things I want to do, I don't find myself doing at times. The things I don't want to do, I what? Find myself sometimes doing it. He found himself in a dilemma, and I don't want any show of hands. Have any of you ever been in that dilemma? Oh, no, none of you, right? <laughs> no, I think we all have faced that at one time or another. In Romans chapter 7 and verse 14, I want to read this from the, uh, the New Living Translation. It puts it really well. Because Romans chapter 7 and verse 14 says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin, Paul said. And I really like the way this is put in the New Living Translation. Paul writes, <clears throat> or it's stated here, so the trouble is not the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human at times. That's the dilemma. And Paul wanted to figure out, how do I deal with this dilemma? How do I deal with this, this human element? Uh, this human flesh that sometimes it wants to rise up, or this human mind that sometimes doesn't want to flow as it should. Yeah, I can relate to that. Uh, I'll be vulnerable a little bit. A number of years ago, there was a situation that happened <clears throat> that I felt was very, very unjust. Uh, it involved someone close to me. I felt something was done that was totally inappropriate. And uh, I found myself caught up emotionally after finding out what transpired. So I sat down and I wrote a letter. Now wisdom would have told me, don't sit down and write a letter. Wisdom would have told me, sleep on it. Give yourself a day or two. I didn't do that. Now, what I wrote in the letter I thought was appropriate as far as what was stated, the facts. But the emotions, the, some of the things I said, were totally inappropriate. And I had to repent of that. I had to change myself and learn from that. That I didn't always use my mind the way I needed to. I had a dilemma like Paul. The things I didn't want to do, I find my, found myself doing. And I had to actually um, apologize to a particular individual. for uh, what, And I did. I apologized to his face. Anybody ever been in that situation? Maybe thinking of something different apart from that? I wanted to share that with you. I, I can understand what Paul uh, is saying here. He wanted to be a part of what God is doing. He wanted to deal with his, his dilemma, but he knew that sometimes the old flesh raised its head or his mind got out of, out of control. And then in Romans chapter 7, verse 24, let's we'll start reading here. Because he talks about the law of God being valuable. He talks about another law <clears throat> that sometimes affected him, the law of sin. And then he says in verse 24 of Romans chapter 7, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Who has the answer? Who's going to move me forward? Who's going to help me deal with these issues that I have so I don't do them like I used to do? 
or I perform like I want to perform, or it will help me realize I need to keep myself under control, and if something is unjust, make sure that I deal with it properly. You know, who's going to help me with that? Who's going to do that for me? And then he says in verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ the Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. He thanked God that God would give him the answers. He thanked God that Jesus Christ would be the one to give him the, 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 the delivery or deliver him. And he thanked God that through Jesus Christ, he could be victorious over his life. That's one of the primary lessons we need to learn during this time of the year. That God gives us the ability to be victorious over our flesh and over the mind. That we don't have to serve sin any longer. Oh, am I saying we'll always be perfect? No. But it does tell us that we are not to practice sin. And that is the direction that God wants us to be going. Now chapter 8, I want to spend a lot more time in. Because we move on now to chapter 8, which really discusses the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Uh, chapter 8 discusses living by Pentecost, or the teaching of Pente Pentecost through the power of God's Holy Spirit, not living after the flesh. And if we want to deal with our flesh, we're going to have to learn to live even more by the Spirit and the power of God Almighty. That is imperative. So chapter 8 discusses how Jesus Christ will help him, Paul, and help us. And that is the subject of the sermon today, being victorious. Paul gives the answer to the question that he asked because he knew the answer. God wants us to be successful in controlling our lives and successful in being delivered through Jesus Christ. So let's look at chapter 8 a little more <clears throat> carefully. Verse 1 of chapter 8. We find Paul now beginning to discuss what he meant by, <clears throat> with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin, verse 25 of Romans 7. In essence, what he's saying is if I allow myself to live after the flesh, I'm going to sin. But if I allow myself to live after the Spirit, I'm going to serve God. That's the whole sermon I, that I want to cover with you. I just did it in one verse. But we're going to develop that a little bit. Okay? So now after he says the law of the Spirit, the law of the flesh, it says in verse 1 of verse, chapter 8, There is therefore now no condemnation. To those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but now walk according to the Spirit. There's no condemnation. Condemna condemnation. It doesn't mean that we don't condemn, condemn sin. Sin brings pain. Who walk in Christ, who are united to Jesus Christ. And that denotes a close and intimate union, an intimate walk, an intimate conduct, an intimate life with him. What that means, if we're going to overcome sin and overcome some of the issues that we may still have in our life, it's going to happen because we begin to walk better with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's the key in having God's Spirit to work closely within us and not after the flesh. In other words, we don't live to gratify the corrupt desires and passions of the flesh. Verse 1 is talking about. To walk after the flesh is clearly seen in Galatians 5, 19 and 21, 19 through 21. I'll read that to you so you don't need to turn over there. What, the, what do the works of the flesh look like? What does walking after the flesh means? mean? Well, Galatians 5, verse 19 says, Now the works of the flesh are evident. Adultery, fornication, Uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, evils, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. I have a pretty good sized list there. And Paul told the church at Corinth, 
He says, some of you walked in these before you were called and had God's Holy Spirit and began to walk after the Spirit. Some of you lived this lifestyle. Again, no show of hands. Any of you ever lived this lifestyle or had elements of it? Only you can answer that question. So Paul says, if we're going to live after the flesh, then we're going to serve sin. And I, this identif identifies that. So it fo follows that a man or a woman whose purpose in life is to gratify his own personal corrupt desires cannot be a Christian, cannot live as a Christian, cannot practice Christianity. And when you understand it, when you look at this section where it talks about the, uh, the, 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 the works of the flesh, it's a very easy test to be applied in your life or my life. All I have to do, do is look at these and say, is this what drives me? Is this what motivates me? That's a test of what Christianity is not. It's an easy test when you really understand it. If a man or a woman lives this way, there's no need to question his or her character. It is what it is. And Levin Brad says, this is what we come out of. So he says, if we live after the flesh, these things, we will serve the law of sin. Made very clear in uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. But those who do not walk after the flesh, but after the spirit, will serve God and serve the spirit. As the Holy Spirit leads us, prompts us, guides us, and produces fruits in us. Now, what do the works of the Spirit look like? Same section of Scripture, Galatians, chapter 5, verses 23 through 26. It says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ, who are walking after the Spirit, have crucified the flesh, those things we just read, with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So that's what living after the Spirit is all about. And if a man has these fruits, or any of you ladies out there, have these fruits, Paul says you're living the life of a Christian. You're living the life of following and walking in the Spirit. That also is a test that is easily applied, is it not? Do you see yourself in uh, Galatians 5, 23 through 26? Do you see that as predominantly your character and your life that you live? Again, rem rem remember, I'm not talking about perfection. I'm talking about a way of life that we walk. We have to deal with the dilemmas at times. But God gives us the power and strength of that as well. Verse 2 of Romans 8 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made, has made me free from the law of sin and death. He talks about the law. The law of the Spirit. All he's saying there when he says the law is the command or the influence of the Spirit. The rule of the Spirit. What the Spirit does for you. And that the Spirit produces life. In other words, it exerts a control, which is, which is here called a law. The law of the Spirit, it's, it's a control that if we utilize God's Holy Spirit, produces something. So he calls it a, a law. It's what, how we're ruled or governed by, as opposed to the flesh. And he says, it's made me free from the law of sin and death. In other words, it has delivered me. Isn't that what Paul was wanting to, uh, wasn't that the question Paul asked? When he was dealing with, with his dilemma, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? Well, Paul knew who it would be, and he was making sure the, uh, the church in Rome understood as well. Because chapter 8 is very clear on who's going to be doing the delivering when we tie closely in to him. He's made me free, or delivered me from the predominant influences and control of sin. You see, brethren, you are not under the control of sin. If you are then you are not utilizing the, the walk with the Spirit effectively enough. Or I am not if, if I am that way. 
It has made me free or delivered me from the influence or the control of sin. I'm not talking about perfection. But it is talking about what 1 John 3, 9 states. Okay, 1 John 3, 9 says, He that walks after the Spirit is begotten of God and does not practice sin. So that is the walk of a Christian. He's not practicing sin, but he's practicing the way of life that God has given to him. And it's through Christ that we're delivered from the influence and the control of what you see in society. And specifically, the law of sin and death are again the controlling influence of sin, which leads to what? Death. Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Verse 3 of Romans chapter 8. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. For what the law could not do. The law of God is a moral law. It's a law that God wants us to live by. But the law could not free us from sin and condemnation. The law identifies sin. But it cannot forgive you your sins. For the law could not do. God did. How? By sending his own son. He did or accomplished it by sending his son Jesus Christ. So that the likeness of sinful flesh. Or in the likeness of sinful flesh. That is Jesus Christ coming into flesh. Born of Mary. Being sacrificed for sin. Then through him condemns, condemns sin in the flesh. In other words, he makes it possible for us to be forgiven our sins. That which the law could not do. That's why he talks about grace and forgiveness of sin through grace. But it's a standard of life living by the law. So Christ condemned, again, sin in the flesh. He came and died for sin. And he died because of sin. And he died because we were sinners. And I think all of us left Passover sobered. We left Passover. Uh, Passover what? Elated and happy. That we did not have to pay the penalty that Jesus Christ paid on our behalf. That's what Paul's talking about here. The value of Jesus Christ. Verse 4 of Romans chapter 8. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So he says, Christ came to enable us to be forgiven our sins. He came in the flesh as a human being. And he says, one of the reasons that he came, or here the specific reason in Romans, is that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. What he's saying is that by the power of God's Holy Spirit, by walking by the Spirit, we can be confirmed to the law. Or we can come to be more obedient to the requirements of the law with the help of God. And that we again are no longer under the influence of the flesh and his corrupt desires, but we are under the influence of God's Holy Spirit. And he says that it might be fulfilled in us, that we might be obedient, obedient and comply with the law's demands. Now those in Dayton, the Cincinnati North, know one of the primary reasons that God gave us his laws and why he wants us to comply with its demands. If I were to ask any single person from Dayton, or Cincinnati North, they would know the answer to that, right? Ladies and gentlemen from, yeah, I see all the heads shaking in, in Cincinnati and, and in, in uh, Cincinnati North. God says, I want you to be obedient to me, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. I want you to live by the commandments that I give to you. And they all will tell you, finish the sentence, Frank, for your good, for your benefit, for your well-being. That's how we need to look upon the law of God. It's beneficial, it's good. And the Christ says, sin has led you astray, your own pulls of the flesh and mind in the past. Now that you're converted, I'm giving you the strength to walk by the Spirit because as you walk by the Spirit, it enables you to, to comply or conform to the way of love, the way of God's law in the Spirit, not just the letter, and you will be blessed by it. It will be a benefit for you. Passover, unleavened bread, beautiful days of blessings that God gives to us. 
that we might be conformed to the law or be obedient to its requirements. And we no longer have to be under the influence of the flesh and its corrupt desires. But you notice, it's who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. It's a very, very important. Verse 5, Romans chapter 8. He said, because they who are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Those who just want to live and have their minds totally focused on what the world desires, the three elements that are in the world, if they live after the flesh, they do the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit do the things of the Spirit. Those in the world are under the influence of the corrupt desires and nature that mankind does have. God didn't, God didn't create mankind with that nature. We all understand that, do we not? We all understand that, I hope. When you look at creation, God said... All those days, including the creation of man, he says it was good. Matter of fact, he says it was very good. How did this sinful nature, how did this evil desire, how did this corrupt flesh become a part of man? Well, there was an adversary. An individual called Lucifer who became Satan the devil was out to destroy man, and he came in and he influenced Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve chose to follow that influence. They chose to partake of Satan's fruit, and they chose to disobey their father. They chose to decide what was right and wrong, and humanity has decided from that time forward to do that. And we know the outcome, do we not? Do you know the outcome? Now, there's a movie out there called Noah. I'm not going to watch it. I heard it's lousy. But uh, we all know what happened during the time of Noah, right? Why the flood came. It says that the heart and the mind of man was set to what? Continually <laughs> do evil. He had, man had become so perverted and corrupted by this evil nature that he chose to follow and Satan that it was, it, he, mankind had to start over. And so God brings mankind across the flood. And God knew, based on what he said about Jesus Christ there in Genesis, that he would have to bruise Satan's head and bring about a change in mankind's nature. And that's why Christ came and why the Holy Spirit came, that we who are part of God's way of life live a different lifestyle. Leads us in a different direction. We reject Satan. We, he flees from us. That which is in us is greater than that which is in the world. So society is under, you know, the desires of the flesh. They are unrenewed in their approach to life. We are to be renewed in ours. They mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, we, we again see in verse 5, are supremely devoted to the gratification of God. We're under his influence and we're led by the spirit. It says the things of the spirit, those are the things where the spirit produces or which affects the mind. Again, Galatians 5, 21 through 23. Verse 6. For these days of unleavened bread. Paul goes on to say, For to be carnally minded. Uh, that's a mind apart from God. Anybody here ever had chili con carne? To be carnally minded, that just a, means a meaty mind going contrary to, to God. To be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace and is our deliverance. It's what delivers us. So again, he's just repeating over and over about the flesh and the minding of the spirit, and making the spirit the object of our, our love and the object of our life. Romans 7. He then goes on to say, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Is he saying the fact that all of you are human beings, fleshly human beings, you can't please God? Is that what he means here? Or does he mean, based on the context, those again who are walking after the flesh? I want to read something to you 
uh, in my preparation of my studies the past uh, week, week and a half, I was going through a number of commentaries, getting some concepts about uh, Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8, going through some of my old Apostle Paul, uh, Epistles of Paul notes. And I found Barnes' notes to be very interesting. It's an interesting concept, the carnal mind. Let me read this to you. Barnes' note says, it's not, it does not mean the mind itself, the intellect or the will. It does not suppose that the mind is physically depraved. We know that God made us what? Good. But it means that the minding of the things of the flesh, giving in to them, or giving them supreme attention, is hostility against God. It involves the sinner in a controversy with him, and hence leads to death and woe. This passage should be, uh, this passage should not be alleged, according to Barnes, should not be alleged in proof that the person is physically depraved. Sometimes I've heard people say, well, the world is just physically depraved. No, it's not. It's going contrary to God, but the world as a whole is not physically depraved. There are a lot of people who eat from what? Knowledge of good and evil, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and a lot of people eat from the good side. And a lot of people... Eat from the bad side. Eat more. Let me, let me rephrase. A lot of people eat more from the good side. And a lot of people eat more from the bad side. I would say Al Capone, Babyface Nelson, Pretty Boy Floyd, Hitler, Mussolini, Mussolini kind of ate more from the, the bad side. But I see a lot of people who really want to help and serve mankind, and they understand that concept of, of giving. And they're blessed by it. Mr. Armstrong used to say that, God's laws are eternal, and whatever laws you keep, whether you know it or not, you're going to be blessed by it. I have always believed that. I've always believed that. So he says, this passage should not be alleged and proved that a person is physically depraved, but merely that, that, there, uh, that where there is a supreme regard to the flesh, there is hostility to God. It does not directly prove the doctrine of universal depravity, but it proves only that where such attention exists to the corrupt desires of the soul... There is hostility to God. It is indeed implied that the supreme regard to the flesh exists everywhere by nature. But this is not expre expressly affirmed. For the object of the apostle here is not to teach the, uh, the doctrine of depravity, but to show that where such a depravity in fact exists, and I like this next sentence, it involves the sinner in a fearful controversy with God. Where it exists is because we've separated ourselves from God and we've allowed ourselves to live according to the flesh. And Paul says humanity has gone that way and now we need to live according to the spirit. Do you want to deal with your issues? Do you really want to deal with your issues? If you have any. Okay. And you've got to live by the spirit of God. You've got to live by walking after the spirit. That is the fundamental key the development of a righteous life. We already saw about what walking after, after the Spirit is like. I wanted to read that to you because I'd never read anything like that in my 45 years in the ministry. The first time I've read anything like that, and I, I thought that was interesting. I'm, I'm going to share that. Now, not everybody will agree with that. But as I read this, looking over the audience, I saw a lot of heads going like this, too. A lot of people understood. They were shaking their heads. Oh, that makes sense. Makes sense. So he says, The carnal mind is enmity against God because it walks after the flesh. It is not subject to the law of God, God nor indeed can be. It's, it's enmity. It's hostile. It's against God and towards you know, Satan. It's not subject. It just isn't going to be as long as it's walking after the flesh. And neither indeed can be. It's an absolute certainty. That as long as you walk that way, you are not going to be subject to God or his law. It ain't going to happen. That's why we have to learn to live after the Spirit, walk after the Spirit. Romans 8, verse 8. So then they who are in the flesh cannot please God. In other words, it follows, it leads to the fact that as long as you're willing to live in the flesh or how the, the flesh wants to drive you, you cannot please God. Those who are unrenewed, who supremely follow the, the desires of the flesh and appetites are going to be contrary to God just cannot please him. How are your appetites, brethren? Well, probably some of you are wanting a nice piece of French bread right now. Right? But how are your, how are your appetites? What is it that, 
that you really want to eat partake of? Is it the leavened bread of sin or the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth? What is your appetite? What is it you really want to do? What is it that drives you? I have to ask myself those same questions. And then Romans 8 verse 9 is very encouraging. You know, Paul's talking about how to be delivered, what keeps you separated and in bondage and what delivers you. And then he tells you this. For you in Cincinnati today, you are not in the flesh. You're not in the flesh. Now you can pinch yourself and say, yes I am. That's not what he's talking about, right? He says, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be, the spirit of God dwells in you. And if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he has none of his. So he says, those of you who have been called by God, who have been converted, who have given into that conversion, who have walked after the teachings of God, who have God's Holy Spirit, you don't live by the flesh anymore. It doesn't drive you any longer. Because we have God's Holy Spirit in us. We're now spiritually minded. We're now under the direct influence of God's Holy Spirit, not the flesh. And it, because it dwells in us. Now, notice it says it dwells in us. It doesn't say it occasionally passes through. Right? The Holy Spirit dwells. It doesn't make an occasional visit. Like we make it, make, may, may make an occasional visit to the throne of God. In prayer. No, it dwells in us. It dwells in us. And the word dwells denotes intimacy of connection. It means that those things which are the fruits of the Spirit are produced in our hearts and in our minds. Because it dwells in us. And if it doesn't, again, here's a test of Christianity, then it doesn't apply. We're not a Christian. Drop down to verse 14. Romans 8 and verse 14. It isn't a matter that Christ says the Holy Spirit is in you and it makes you a Christian. That's part of it. But if you want to overcome and you want to move forward in your Christianity and walk and get rid of the leavening spiritually out of your life, then verse 14, Paul says, is also important. Paul understood that verse 14 was necessary for him to be delivered from that wretched man that he was. To help him be delivered from the dilemmas that he faced. Also needed for us to be delivered from our own personal dilemmas. Myself from allowing myself to be carried away emotionally and saying and writing something I should never have written. He says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons or the children of God. It isn't just having God's Spirit in you, being baptized and receiving the Spirit and say, done, accomplished, finished. I was baptized, I have God's Holy Spirit, done. No, he says, once you have God's Holy Spirit, you then now delete, need to let that Spirit lead you. That's walking after the Spirit. Does that make sense? Sure, absolutely it does. He says, these are the sons of God. In other words, we submit our lives to God's influence and God's control. In other words, the Spirit is shown to be influencing, suggesting, and helping us in the walk that we have. He says, these then are the sons of God. These are the individuals who are part of the family of God begotten today with God's Holy Spirit. These are the individuals that one day will receive the ultimate deliverance Shown by, by the way, uh, you look at Passover, Unleavened Bread, and Pentecost as magnificent teachings and holy days on deliverance. Then you look at Trumpets, Atonement, Feast of Tabernacles, and Last Great Day as great events that the first three make possible when you fully understand it. So the deliverance ultimately occurs at one of the great events. What event is that? Anybody remember? Trumpets. The great events of Je event of Jesus Christ returning. And we are delivered ultimately to being a spirit being. Ultimately being an individual who no longer has the flesh, but is spirit. Delivered. 
Actually, deliver from the last enemy, which is death. We are now the sons of the living God. So now that we've gone through uh, and took a very cursory look at chapter 5, 6, and 7 of Romans, and saw how they fit with Passover and unleavened bread, as well as Pentecost, and then took a little deeper look into chapter 8, chapter 8, where Paul gave the answer to his dilemma, who shall deliver me from this body of death with Jesus Christ, through the power of his Holy Spirit, living his life in us, in us and showing us that we walk after the Spirit. That's how we're delivered. Now, now that we've seen Paul show us how to have victory in overcoming uh, ourselves, and that it involves our hearts and our minds in tune with God's Spirit, I want to evaluate a particular scripture, maybe two, we'll see if I have time for the second one. I want to evaluate a, a scripture that is commonly misunderstood based in the context of what we've covered here. And that scripture is found in Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9. And I say this is commonly misunderstood, and I'm not going to say where I heard this, but I heard an individual talking with another person. And uh, first of all, he was telling that, per that person that because he's human, he's still carnal. He still has an evil heart. He also told them that you can't think like God because God's thoughts are higher than ours. And, uh, you know, I, I, wasn't eaves I wasn't eavesdripping. <laughs> but the guy was speaking loud enough, and I was about five, six feet away, that I heard this, and I'm sitting there shaking my head saying, wait, wait a minute. That's not what conversion and having God's Holy Spirit is all about. The human heart, the fleshly heart, God says in Jeremiah 17, 17 9, is, is evil. But what does he say to you as a Christian? What does he say to me? You become converted. And I've cut the stony part of your heart away and I've given you a heart of flesh. And I've taken and put in your minds and your hearts the spirit of my law so that you can think differently. Romans 8 is talking about a different heart and mind. Anyway, I walked away. The following Sabbath, I gave a sermon in Cincinnati North on that subject. Because I said, people need to understand the difference in, 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 in carnality and conversion. Now, don't get me wrong. You can go back and have a heart. You can, you can remake that evil heart. You can go back and resurrect that evil, hard-headed carnality that walks after the flesh. All of us can. Paul says that's like what? The dog turning back to its vomit. And the pig to the miry clay or the filth. But it's a choice that we make. Well, individuals can go back to that, but that's not how you are when you're living by God's way of life that he gives to you and by the spirit that he's placed within you. I, I, I will always disagree. There might be ministers who disagree with me. I don't know. But I will always disagree with the fact that you have an evil heart and an evil mind if you have God's Holy Spirit in you. I'm not saying it's a perfect mind or a perfect heart. I already told you about my dilemma. But that's not how I want to be. That's not how I want to walk. How I want to be and how I want to walk is in service to God and my Savior Jesus Christ. That's what I want. And that's what John says my MO is. You know, don't sin, he says. Your MO should be to follow, but if you do, you have a Savior. 1 John chapter 2 who will forgive your sins even when you write this stupid letter. <laughs> Isaiah 55, verse 8 and verse 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. This individual was using that, those two verses to tell these individuals they can't think like God. God's far above our way of thinking. But why does God say what he does in these scriptures? What's the reason for him saying these things? Like I said, there are some who believe that we can't think like God because of this scripture. I ask, is that true? Now, I think we all know that God's IQ is greater than ours. <laughs> Duh, right? But is that what he's talking about? That's not the point. The point 
of Isaiah's writing here is that Israel and Judah, as far as that's concerned, were both sinning grievously against God. They were receiving, sinning grievously. They were abusing the widow. They were abusing the orphans. The leaders were taking bribes and they were perverting justice. They were involved with idolatry. Their thoughts and their actions definitely were not God's. Matter of fact, their thoughts Ideas, concepts, and actions were of Satan. And so God says, look, my thoughts are not your thoughts. You're not thinking like I'm thinking. You're not acting like I'm acting. My thoughts are so much higher than You're in the base of the earth. You need to begin to think and set your eyes on those things that are above. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. Your ideas, concepts, and actions are not my actions. Notice verse 7. Of chapter 55 before he makes the statement in verse 8 and 9 Isaiah says let the let the wicked man forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts in other words forsake the way you are living and what you're doing forsake the way you are thinking because you're not thinking like me and instead let him return to the Lord and then he will have mercy upon him and to our God because he will abundantly pardon. So God isn't saying you can't think like him. He's saying you are not thinking like him, Israel, Judah. And so you need to repent and do what? what, what what's, the, what's the bottom line? What, what is the context telling us? So you need to repent and do what? Begin to think like me. You need to repent and begin to act like me. Because my thoughts are up here. And that's where your thoughts need to be. That's where my thoughts need to be. Not on this earth, not dealing with the pulls of the flesh and living that way of life. I pulled, I pulled a statement out of Matthew Henry's commentary as well, like I said when I was preparing this, on Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. I think he puts it really well. He says, if we look up to heaven, we find God's counsels there high and transcendent. We find his thoughts and his ways infinitely above ours. The wicked then are urged to forsake their evil ways and thoughts and to return to God and his way of thinking. To bring their ways and to bring their thoughts to concur and comply with his. That's the context and the meaning of Isaiah 55 and 8. For he says, my thoughts and ways are not yours. But they sure weren't. Theirs was evil. They were thinking evil thoughts and evil actions. He goes on to say, yours are conversant only about things beneath. They are of the earth earthy. But mine are above, as the heavens is higher above the earth. And if you would approve yourselves true penitence, yours also must be too. So set your affections and your thoughts, your minds on things above. So the point being made by Isaiah isn't that we can't think as God does. But we better think as he does. That is what will lead you to deal with your dilemmas. We better walk, as we've emphasized extensively, after the spirit and not after the flesh. So Matthew Henry is correct. Walking after the spirit is setting your mind and affections on things above. After all, isn't that what Paul said? Colossians chapter 3. Turn over there. You want to walk after the Spirit? Deal with your dilemmas? Colossians 3, verse 1. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Our baptismal. Definitely symbolic of that. Since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above. For Christ is seated at the right hand of the God and set your minds. So we're talking about the minds and the heart. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. That's what Isaiah was referencing. Because you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. And then verses 12 through 17 gives us a very gives us clear instructions again of walking after the Spirit, similar to Galatians. If you drop down to verse 12, it says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly beloved, 
Clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since all members, or since as members of one body were called to peace. And be thankful. And let the word of God dwell richly in you. Dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of our Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. How else does walking after the Spirit look? How else does it look? Philippians 4, verse 8 and 9. This is where our minds need to be, brethren. Philippians 4, 8 and 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admi uh, uh, ad uh, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Have your mind focused on these things. And whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And then the God of peace will be with you. You might even tie 2 Corinthians 10, 5 in with that. You don't need to turn there. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse, verse, verse 5 says, bringing every thought into captivity. And that is done by fulfilling Philippians chapter 4. Bringing every thought into captivity. We already covered Galatians chapter 5, so we don't need to do that again. So those who, belong, those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, we let the Spirit drive us and keep us moving forward. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And for time, I'm just going to reference these. If you want to turn and read them, that's fine. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Talks of a spiritual transformation. It talks about going from being conformed to the world to being conformed to God. And when you read that section of scripture, that equals a renewal of your mind. How you think. Similar to putting off the old man in the renewing of your mind. Ephesians 4.23. Hebrews 8 and verse 10. Hebrews 8 and verse 10. This is quoted from Jeremiah 31 and verse 33. Where Paul tells us, according to the new covenant, of which all of you are a part. All of you are part of the new covenant. The new covenant now places God's laws into the mind and into the hearts of the believers. It's no longer written on stone. It's now a part of us. And as we saw in Romans, by the Holy Spirit, God enables us now to actually live more that way of life. It's now actually within us. Now as we move forward, getting closer to the conclusion, those are words people love to hear. <clears throat> Let's go back to Romans 8. Paul also tells us something very important for <clears throat> something we need to understand. In Romans 8, this walking after the flesh or walking after the spirit is up to us. It is up to us. It's our choice. We have the choice in how we will live because we're all free moral agents. If you will notice, in some of my reading, I didn't emphasize it at that time, I will now. There are many ifs in Romans chapter 8. So which choice will you make? What choice will I make? There are many ifs. Notice Romans 8, verse 7 and 8. It talks about the carnal, fleshly mind is enmity against God. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Does this mean as long as we are physical, we can't please God? Verse 9. 
Maybe it's a matter of our individual choice. Notice it says, if the Spirit of God dwells in you, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. It's a big if. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If Christ is in you, then the flesh is dead, and the Spirit is life. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus Christ dwells in you, he'll give life to your mortal body through that Spirit that dwells in you. Notice it says the Spirit, Spirit, Spirit must reside in you, not an occasional visit. In verse 13, it says, If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you put, death, put to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. If is huge in Romans chapter 8. If, 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 if. All that is saying is, brethren, in Cincinnati and Dayton, we have a choice. If these things happen one way, this is the outcome. If they happen another way, this is the outcome. Which side of if are you going to come down on? Which side of if am I going to come down on? What choice am I going to make? Live after the Spirit or live after the flesh? In conclusion, if we live after the Spirit, we will be able to overcome any trial. Paul knew that. That's why I said, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ that by walking after the Spirit, I can deal with all these issues. Doesn't mean you won't make mistakes. But whatever issue you face in life can be dealt with. But it takes God in you for some of them. Walking in the Spirit has great benefits. Again, I'm just going to quote some of these for you. Romans 8, 37. Romans 8, 37. No matter the trial or the hardship, God says in all things we are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. We're more than conquerors. More than conquerors. So Paul doesn't leave them hopeless or helpless. He gives them great encouragement that they too, like him, can deal with their, 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 uh, their issues. Christ said in John chapter 16, verse 33, in the world you will have troubles. I like the expression, in the world you shall have tribulations or you shall is have issues. But we don't put a period there. When you are walking in the spirit, Christ says, don't worry. I overcame the world. And in me, walking with me, walking in the spirit, you can overcome it too. You can be victorious. 1 John 4.4 4. We can overcome the world and Satan because we're told that that which is in us is stronger than that which is in the world. That's that power of God's Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 15.57, I will ask you to please turn to that one. This will be the last scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Resurrection chapter. The final enemy to be destroyed is death. But I want you to notice the specific statement that can be applicable to whatever we face in life. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. We see here that God gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. But thanks be to God... He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's where the victory comes. We've got to have Christ in us. We need to use the Holy Spirit. We need to reject the way of the flesh, the leavened bread. We need to accept the Spirit of God, the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And of course, that flows right on into Pentecost. So brethren, Christ didn't become our Passover. He didn't live his life in the flesh then go through the ridicule, the abuse, the beatings, and ultimately death, that we should fail. He didn't come here that we should fail. He came here that what? We should be successful. He came here, <clears throat> came here that we may be victorious. That's why he came. We want to be on Jesus' side, brethren, because Jesus Christ always wins. <laughs> he never loses. I want to be on the winning side. It's where I want to be. He never loses. He always wins. And he will give us the victory. <laughs> <laughs>